Welcome back to Combat Mission Shock Force, where we're going to break out the big guns. This video is about how to call in mortars and artillery. These two types of weapons are the big killers on the battlefield, and if they're available, you want to be getting the most out of them. So we're going to have a look at how the call for fire process works, what the options are, and the impact of different types of artillery doctrine and spotting units. And of course, although what you're going to be seeing is the Steam version of Shock Force 2, this works the same way across all the combat mission titles. To explain how it all works, we're going to take the Brits out onto the gunnery range and drop some mortars on an unfortunate Syrian airborne platoon. Calling for fire involves using mortars or artillery for indirect fire. This means that whatever asset we're using can't see the target. In most cases, this is because artillery units are kilometers away off the edge of the map, though on-map units like mortars can usually engage in indirect as well as direct fire. Either way, we need another unit to act as eyes for our asset. Here we've got a mortar fire controller team up on top of a tower where they have a good view over the map. To start the process, we need to select the unit we're going to use to call in the fire mission. If we have available assets, the artillery tab in the middle of the UI will be lit up, and if we click on it, we'll bring up a menu that shows them all. Each little card gives us a load of information. We get a silhouette of the asset. We can see that this one, for example, is an L16. We can see that it's an 81mm mortar, and we can see that this particular asset is on map. If we can't call for a specific asset, the game will let us know. Our first on-map mortar is set up and ready to go. Our second isn't set up. We would have to deploy it before we can use it. Our third mortar is a Syrian 82mm mortar. I substituted in using the editor and it is out of contact because Syrian mortar teams don't have radios. This doesn't mean that we can't use it in the indirect role. If the spotting unit is close enough, they can just yell at them. But here we can send the mortar section HQ over in a Land Rover, and because the section HQ does have a radio, he can act as a relay and the Syrian mortar becomes available. This is more of an issue in the World War II combat mission games where radios are obviously much less common, but it can also crop up in shock force if you're playing as the Syrians, or if your communications are getting jammed. On map assets are always represented individually. Because we have three mortars in our mortar section, we have three mortars to choose from. Very simple. Off map assets, on the other hand, are lumped together. We have an off map mortar section in the menu too. This shows the number of individual tubes on the left above the unit designation and has a line of six green circles under the silhouette. These circles are a representation of the asset's individual tubes or barrels. In this case, we have three mortars, so each one is represented by two circles. When they're green, they can fire at their maximum rate. If they turn red, then the tubes are starting to overheat, and the asset can only fire at its sustained rate. Each support choice has its maximum and sustained rates of fire detailed in the game manual. If we select one of the on-map mortars and look back towards the mortar platoon, we can also see that the unit icon for that particular mortar is flashing, so we can tell exactly which mortar we've got selected. Selecting the unit also brings up some more details in the center panel. Again, we get the unit card for the mortar, but underneath we can see the types and quantity of ammunition it has. In this case, 35 high explosive bombs and five white phosphorus bombs. In the top right of the unit card, there is a coloured shape which represents what the manual refers to as the matchup rating between the spotter and the asset. Probably the best way to conceptualise this is to think of it as an indicator of how many hoops the spotter has to jump through to call for the asset. Our spotter here is the A Company Mortar Fire Controller, and the asset we have selected is one of A Company's mortars. So here we have a very good matchup rating, a bright green circle, because our spotter's job is literally to call on these specific mortars. The upshot of this is that we have a very short delivery time. Down at the bottom of the center panel, we can see that it's just two minutes. If we select a different asset, then we'll have a different matchup rating and the delivery time will change. These mortars are B Company's 81mm mortars, and they take three minutes to call in because they're not A Company's organic mortars. Our A Company mortar controller has to basically get permission to use them from B Company. 
it's still a pretty good matchup though. We're still in the same battalion, so we still have a green circle and a pretty fast call in time. Our mortar fire controller has a worse matchup with these 105mm light guns. The call in time has increased to 6 minutes, and we have a yellow triangle that shows our spotter and the light guns aren't as closely linked. This will all change depending on the spotter as well. The A Company HQ on the balcony below the mortar controllers is also capable of calling for fire, but they are less specialised in this than the mortar controllers, so everything takes longer. The organic mortars take 4 minutes, the non-organic mortars take 6 minutes, and the light guns now take 10 minutes. The Syrian mortar team can't call for fire at all. All the assets are denied to them. Obviously, they're going to struggle to call anybody without a radio, but where NATO forces will let pretty much anyone call for fire, the Syrian army restricts this to specialists like forward observers. This has a lot to do with the standard of training of the average Syrian conscript, but it also has to do with a more rigid command structure. Once we've got our spotter selected, and we've chosen the asset we want to use, we can start setting up the fire mission. In the centre panel we have a choice of point target, area target or linear target. These tell the asset where to fire and are pretty self-explanatory. A point target gives the asset a single point of aim, which can be a spot on the ground or a building or a unit. For an area target our first click sets the centre of a circle and from there we can expand it to the size we want, with the asset looking to spread its fire out inside the area. And for the linear target we click once to start a line and we click again to finish it, with the asset trying to put rounds in along its length. It's also important to remember that, except in a couple of very specific circumstances, we can only target an area the spotter can actually see. So getting your forward observers into good positions with good fields of view, or with a line on parts of the battlefield that are important to your plans, is absolutely key. Also key is not putting valuable FO units into positions that are too obvious, because that's a very good way to get them killed, especially if you're playing against the human opponent. The accuracy of the fire mission can vary with the type of weapon being fired, the range from the asset to the target, the matchup rating between the spotter and the asset, and the experience of the spotter and the asset. In our case, the Syrian airborne platoon is either on the roof of this building or very close by, so a point target on the building should get the job done, once we factor in the natural spread and kill radius of 81mm mortar fire at this range, which is about a thousand metres. Next, we can choose the number of tubes that we want to use. Obviously, we're just using a single mortar here, so we're not going to have that option, but if we were using the light guns, for example, we would be able to choose between firing from one, two, or three guns. Next, we choose the intensity of the fire mission, which basically translates into rate of fire. Heavy is the maximum rate, harass is the slowest rate, usually one round per minute or less. Most assets can't keep up the heavy or medium rates for very long, either because the barrels start to overheat or because the loaders have become physically exhausted, so these tend to drop down to the asset's sustained rate after a while. We're going to go for heavy here because we want to be sure we dump a lot of HE onto the target before it has a chance to run away. Next we get the duration, which controls how many rounds the asset is going to fire per tube. Maximum will use all the ammunition the asset has, long is 20 to 28, medium is 12 to 18, short is 6 to 12, and quick is 2 to 4. After setting up the parameters for fire rate and number of shells, we can select what kind of fusing we want on the outgoing ammunition. General translates into general purpose ground bursting shells, and personnel fires air bursts, which produce a more effective shrapnel pattern. In the modern titles, air bursting shells are usually detonated by proximity fuses at a pretty consistent and effective altitude. In the World War II titles, air bursting shells are generally detonated by timers, which may or may not be correct, so they are somewhat less reliable and may have ground bursts or early detonations mixed in, unless you're the Americans and you're using the BT fuse in the late war. Sometimes armour also appears as a third option. It's a little unclear as to exactly what this does, but it's probably some kind of contact fuse with a slight delay or something like that. Honestly, I've never really used it. It's quite difficult to actually hit tanks with artillery. 
not all assets have access to all three options. Some shells are simply too small to accommodate certain types of fuse or warhead. Here we're dealing with an infantry target, so we're going to go for personnel. Finally, there is sometimes the option to incorporate a delay of 5, 10 or 15 minutes into the fire mission, which can be handy if you're trying to coordinate things. With all these details locked in, we can press confirm and the spotter will get on the radio to the asset. If we check the support menu, the mortar we're calling in is now marked as receiving and we have two green lines on the map, one from the spotter to the target and one from the asset to the target. We've also got the option to cease fire if we need to. We can also see that our spotter can only call in one fire mission at a time. The other assets in the menu are marked spotter busy to show that we can't call on them right now. It takes a while for anything to happen once we kick the turn off, but the fire mission is progressing behind the scenes. At about the 30 second mark, the mortar team we're using gets a green line to the target and we get an audio cue. This indicates that the spotter has passed the information for the fire mission to the mortar team. 45 seconds into the turn, the mortar team has processed the information and starts to react, turning the mortar to face in the right direction and then starting to adjust the elevation. At the end of the first turn, we've now moved on from receiving to spotting and we've also got the option to adjust the fire mission if we want. On turn two, the mortar fires a spotting round. This is basically a single shot for the spotter to check that the asset is on target. The first one lands a little short and off to the left. It's also a ground burst, even though we ordered a personnel mission. Ground bursts make more dust and smoke, so they're easier for the spotter to notice. We get a little delay while the spotter passes this information back to the mortar and issues a correction. Then the mortar adjusts its aim a little again and fires another spotting round. This second round is much closer. The spotter gives a final adjustment and then orders the asset to fire for effect. This kicks off the fire mission proper. Soon the mortar team is throwing 81mm bombs down the tube as fast as they can and rounds start bursting around the target, leading to some unpleasantness for the Syrians. The spotting phase in this instance was pretty fast, with the main delay being the travel time of the spotting rounds. This isn't always the case. Here the terrain is flat and open, so our spotter could easily see where the spotting rounds were coming in. If the spotter can't see where they land because they are wildly off target or because of the terrain, then he'll carry on asking for spotting rounds until he finally sees one. This might not only make it take much longer to call the fire mission in on target or make it potentially impossible, but it also uses up ammunition. Spotting rounds aren't free. Sometimes if it's not working, it's better to cancel and try again. The asset or spotter getting shot will obviously also interfere with the fire mission. Of course the fire mission won't happen, but the main issue is usually the delay that ties up the spotter and or the asset while they try and work out why the other one has stopped talking back over the radio. Obviously this is a very flexible system and it's possible to create pretty much any kind of fire mission that you would like. This is already much, much longer and more in-depth than I intended it to be, so the more advanced artillery stuff like smoke missions, precision missions, target reference points and pre-battle bombardments are going to have to wait for another time. If you can get to grips with the basics here though, you should be able to work them out easily enough. They're pretty self-explanatory. Hope you all enjoyed this video and found it useful. I'll catch you in the next one.